Hello everybody, this is the Unit 8 lecture on declining biodiversity. So one of the patterns that we see in biodiversity, and by, well, I guess I should define what biodiversity is first. Um, we're talking about all the different kinds of species and types of life that we see across the planet. And then on a planetary scale, what we see is we're losing species at an, at an incredible rate right now. Um, it's estimated that by 2100 we will have half the number of plant and animal species that we have today. And we see this across the board. Whether We see a huge dip in corals right now, but birds are decreasing, mammals are decreasing, amphibians are really decreasing, and any pretty much any um, group of organisms that, that you look at were losing species. Now that is due to four main reasons. I mean, realistically, there are reason is that humans are getting to be extremely high populations numbers all over across the world but as those humans come in what we do is we do four different things habitat destruction invasive species over exploitation and pollution so let's spend some time thinking about each one of those here in a little bit But first, I want to ask the question of where has habitat actually been lost? Okay, so think about that for a second. Now, most of the time when I've, I've done this class in person, the answers I get are, oh, it's tropical rainforests, right? Where has the habitat been lost? We're losing tons of tropical rainforests. Well, that is true. We have lost habitat. But I would submit that really, realistically, we've lost much, much more habitat just right here in the United States. So this is a satellite photo of, um, of whitewater, right? And what do we see? What is the native or the, the native habitat around this area should have been an oak savanna. And what do we see now? Realistically, most of this is corn. Sure, we have some kettle moraine forest over here, but realistically, most of what we have around us is corn, wheat, and soybeans, right? And that is by far um, not a good habitat for most of the native species that we have in this area. So what we see is that habitat destruction and maybe you shouldn't say habitat destruction and it could be you know habitat modification okay so um, just because we cut down a forest well we've destroyed the forest but there you know might be a grassland that takes over in that area there's still a habitat it's just not the same habitat that was before so you know we can think of extreme habitat modification here maybe uh, more realistically and but what we see is habitat destruction has is been the the main reason why we're losing species across the planet. Seventy three percent of the species that are extinct or rare uh, are due to us destroying habitat. Now, why do we you know why do we change habitat? Why do we change the habitat into a human? Uh, used habitat. The m biggest one is agriculture and I don't mean to get down on farmers. Um, I like to eat, right? W I need food. Everybody needs food. So we know that agriculture is going to have an impact but we do need to be realistic that agriculture has been the largest impact on um, or the largest reason why we're losing uh, native habitat. Uh, the second biggest reason then is urban development. So right now what we have somewhere around 80% of Americans are living in urban urban areas and all of those urban areas are pretty much just getting bigger and we're taking more of the native habitat and turning it into um, you know, cities and towns and everything. Uh, two smaller ones are forestry and mining. Now, you know, we maybe in the past that those have been um, bigger impacts to destroy uh, habitats but you know so for forests do regrow maybe not the same way that they were before but um, uh, and then mining generally we think about as more localized areas where um, certain things are taken out of the ground and so all four of these things kind of put together have destroyed a lot of habitat for a lot of species and we're seeing that um, 
that has caused a lot of species to go rare. Now I talk here a little bit about fragmentation. Um, what frag habitat fragmentation is, is you know we um, humans don't use all the land just like you know in, in a straight line around a city. There's lots of in this picture here we have some potentially this could be native forest and a little habitat patch of native forest here and then a one over here. So there's actually, you know, in this picture there's a decent amount of native forest, but um, because they're all isolated, we'll, we'll be talking about this this idea later on, but because they're all isolated it kind of makes a, a, a problem for um, these habitat patches are not really acting like the native habitat that we see. I think, um, so we'll catch up with this later when we're looking at the land use chapter. Now, I think this picture though is really um, and poignant for this, por this point I'm trying to make is that we have lost a ton of habitat in the US. Now this, these, this is the United States at night, right? Now all these lights here are a little oversaturated, right? These probably shouldn't, all these points of light probably shouldn't be as big as that. But I think it does show how much our landscape, our whole country, which, you know, we're the what, fifth biggest country in the world, how we um, have taken over this land and turned it into a human use. Now, basically, the only spot where you cannot find humans in the lower 48 is you know in the middle of the desert in Nevada and for obvious reasons but pretty much everywhere else we don't have um, a lot of space available for natural habitat anymore. Second reason I want to talk about our, that we're losing biodiversity is invasive species. There's plenty of examples of species um, coming in from somewhere else and having a huge impact on on the land, on the organisms that we have there. Um, there's a difference between invasive species and non-native species. Um, a non-native species might be something like, uh, trying to, here in Wisconsin might be the ringtail pheasant or ringneck pheasant. This is the, the pheasant that you see, you know, that a lot of people like to go hunting for. Um, it's non-native, it's actually from Asia. Uh, but people like to hunt them and we brought them over because we knew that they would grow well in the grasslands of our um, of the United States and they're here but they don't like cause huge problems and don't hurt um, our native vegetation don't really compete with a lot of other um, organisms birds that we have around here and invasive species are oftentimes these species that come in have really high reproductive rates um, and steal, basically steal all the nutrients, steal all the food sources of the things, the native species that are there. Uh, and the reason that they can do that often is that the ecosystem doesn't have the natural defenses or checks. So what do I mean by that? That um, uh, basically, you know, you might have a a predator that preys on that species and keeps it down in low numbers. So an example here is in um, this is the south southwestern tip of Australia. Okay, and what we see here is there's this really clear line right along here, and that clear line you can see is right here. Uh, what this is is a fence, and this fence is kind of famous, and it's known as the rabbit-proof fence. So um, what we see is Australia has this huge problem with rabbits. Now, these rabbits are English rabbits. Um, the countryside is just overrun with rabbits in certain parts of Australia. Um, the countryside in England doesn't have a problem with rabbits because we have foxes and birds and hawks that will eat them and that kind of thing. Well, they don't have those predators in Australia. So uh, the rabbits have basically across the continent uh, gotten in really, really big numbers. And we don't usually think about, you know, just like a cottontail rabbit as a problem, but it is in Australia. So what they've actually done is starting to build fences 
to and then get rid of the rabbits in a specific area. So what you can see here is on this side of the fence they've gotten rid of rabbits um, and on this side of the fence the rabbits are still there and you can see that there's huge difference in the vegetation basically the rabbits have eaten all the vegetation on this side of the fence and on this side of the fence you know, the natural vegetation is still there it's a more desert like here and just right over here you can even see it affecting the weather so these clouds are due to more moisture in this part that doesn't just get evaporated right away so like it's hard to think about that a bunch of rabbits are um, affecting the weather in Australia. Uh, another example here of an invasive species that can really cause biodiversity problems is um, domestic cats. Now I should preface this with I hate cats, I'm allergic to them and I just don't like them at all. But here's a reason why you all should not like cats. Um, Stevens Island it's this island off of New Zealand, or in New Zealand, um, and there was, um, it's extinct now, but the Stevens Island Wren. So it's this tiny little bird. Um, it couldn't fly. Uh, and so on Stevens Island, they built a lighthouse. And the lighthouse keeper, the first lighthouse keeper, brought his cat. The cat's name was Tibbles. And what Tibbles would do is, um, you know, this is 200, 300 years ago, I forget how long ago it was actually but uh, the lighthouse keeper didn't really feed his cat very much and the cat had to go find his own food well there's a bunch of these flightless birds on this island what does the cat eat it eats a bunch of these wrens and basically one cat Tibbles is responsible for uh, reduction of pretty much all of these Stevens Island wren um, later on a couple more cats were brought in just by people there and that finished off the species and it completely um, it went extinct. So this is a perfect example of this ecosystem, Stevens Island, this small island that's the only spot where you find this little wren, this little bird, and that bird had no chance to survive from the, the predatory skills that you know a domestic cat is. So um, an example to show how invasive species can really uh, hurt uh, native populations. One thing we're experiencing right now, kind of all across the, um, the western United States, is an expansion of the mountain pine beetle. Now, the mountain pine beetle is this it's really tiny beetle. I think this is only like a half inch long or something. Uh, but what they do is they go to a pine tree um, and they lay an egg in the pine tree. And then a little uh, beetle larvae grows in inside the tree, eats the the... Uh, the yummy parts of that tree that, that transport the, um, the sugars basically throughout the tree. And if you get enough of these infestations in this mountain pine beetle, it'll kill off the tree. Now, what's happened then is this mountain pine beetle was basically from Mexico and its range has been expanding northward as the climate has been warming. So right now what we see is this mountain pine beetle has made it up, you know, somewhere South Dakota, um, into Montana a little bit and it's you can see here that here's a, a forest that's been affected by the mountain pine beetle basically all of these orange trees are dead pine trees that um, have been infested with all of these beetles and they're doing a huge uh, making huge problems for a lot of the forests right now in you know the, the mountain west area of the United States and these trees basically just have no chance to be able to do this. There's um, some evidence that you know trees might be developing as the whole population gets wiped out. You see, there are some trees that are surviving here that they might be able to um, evolve around it a little bit, but um, we'll see if that is quick enough for for the forests of the West here real soon. All right, the third reason is that we see declining biodiversity is over-exploitation. Now, over-exploitation, what I mean by that is basically humans using um, certain species faster than they can be replaced, okay? So if you think about a lake, you know, we, we 
here in Wisconsin have a really big fishing culture and you know lots of people go fishing they go to lakes and you know you have your limit of how many fish that you can take from this lake per day and basically what the Wisconsin DNR has set up is you know these limits of we can only take out this many fish from this lake each year so that they can reproduce new babies and have a, have a good enough population through the years or a sustainable population but there's plenty of times where we're seeing uh, in the past where this is you know they have not set up these type of um, limits and or people are breaking the laws and still hunting um, taking harvesting these organisms uh, this is a, here is a great example this is not a hill it is a pile of bison skulls um, in the late 1800s what we saw is there were millions of bison um, along the prairies of North America and um, basically we hunted them almost to extinction where there is only about 800 to 900 of them left um, on the whole continent and um, you know basically what they're doing is they were killing these bison and grinding up their bones for fertilizer um, and really not using any of the bison for eating or anything but um, I think some people think this is all something in the past like deer are really interesting example the white-tailed deer that you know you can see that everybody hunts here in Wisconsin um, was eliminated from almost most of the 48 states I don't think it was ever eliminated from uh, Wisconsin but I used to live in Kansas and I found newspaper articles from the 1960s that say white-tailed deer spotted in such-and-such such county so it's um, you know the white-tailed deer is a great story that has bounced back from like almost extinction but um, there's plenty of species that that hasn't happened and right now I think one of the the biggest examples of current over exploitation that we're doing right now are marine fisheries. Right now we have about 10% of the large species of fish that we used to have in the past um, and we're just basically pulling those fish out faster than they can reproduce so their populations are just continuing to decline. Maybe a more charismatic example is rhinos. Um, I really like rhinos. I was fortunate enough to a couple years ago go to South Africa and I got to see rhinos and they were these really cool animals. Um, but we were told there that we were not supposed to um, announce or tell people, other people, where uh, the rhinos were because um, poachers could get them. If you go to Cougar National Park, there at each little like station, they have this board where you can put up your sightings, but they never wanted us to put rhino sightings so that poachers couldn't come there and look to find where the poachers were. Rhinos are heavily sought after. Even in national parks, there's plenty of poachers that will go um, there. And it's pretty sad to see this. This is the value of rhino horn um, what we're seeing is a poacher will only get this, this is in British pounds so that would be probably I don't know $850 or something uh, per kilogram of horn um, that the poachers would actually get but on the market it's almost twice the value or it's more than twice the value here of gold um, and so because people are trying to really want this rhino horn there's a lot of pressure in Africa for people to be um, over exploiting these animals, right? We've hunted rhinos to um, certain subspecies are almost extinct. Um, um, but what uh, I think this graph is really interesting that we have a really good idea of rhinos, how many rhinos are killed because mo many, many rhinos are actually guarded and um, their their bodies are found and able to figure out why they died. And what we see is, you know, even just in the last couple of years, I'm, these data are a little bit old, but, um, you know, a lot of rhinos are being killed here in the last couple of decades, and it's increasing. Um, but if you look, this is applications for antique rhino horn re-exports. It's basically, um, and this is in the EU, so this is um, in Europe of, you know, this shouldn't match up, right? What we see is the 
African rhinos that are getting killed currently are being exported to the EU and they're just being said, oh no, no, these are antiques and these are um, not, you know, like, oh, these were killed 200 years ago. But it's obvious that since these are so correlated with each other that it's, it's just people killing the rhinos now and exporting their horns. So when we think about, you know, overexploitation, there's plenty of examples. I think you can probably think of some examples of where uh, species have been um, gone extinct directly due to humans, you know, taking taking them, or hunting them, or harvesting them, or however they take them, right? Um, you know, things like pollution are a little bit more indirect, right? It's not like we go out and purposely try to pollute, and I guess maybe some people do, uh, but things like habitat loss and pollution are a little bit more indirect. Um, but they are, you know, pollution is relatively common. I'm, I'm not going to say much about this. I think it's pretty co uh, pretty obvious to see that when we release chemicals into the environment, right, there are no fish that are going to be living in this river that is downstream of uh, acid mine drainage. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory how pollution can kill kill species. But those are the four reasons that we see biodiversity decreasing across the planet.